may be seated. Good morning, and I welcome you to Olive Branch Baptist Church today. When I drove to church today, it was sunny, and now it looks like it's uh, 8 o'clock at night. It's thunder, lightning, heavy rain. It uh, fits well with the sermon this morning. So maybe the Lord had something in mind when he brought this weather, and you will find out in a moment why it fits so well. Also, I wanted to read to you this morning a psalm, 143, also very fitting for today. This psalm is a prayer of David. And David, as he prays, is in a moment, as you know you have been, where he desperately needs the Lord. And I know at times we know that uh, when we're hurting. When others we know are hurting, uh, we know how desperately we need the Lord and we cry out to Him. But isn't it true that really every moment of our life, we desperately need the Lord? And so whether you feel this morning that a cloud and a storm is over your life, or whether you feel like your life is going well, all of us need Him. And this psalm reminds us. David sings in Psalm 143, Lord Hear my prayer. In your faithfulness, listen to my plea. And in your righteousness, answer me. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one alive is righteous in your sight. For the enemy has pursued me, crushing me to the ground, making me live in darkness like those long dead. My spirit is weak within me. My heart is overcome with dismay. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all you have done. I reflect on the works of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. I am like parched land before you. Answer me quickly, Lord. My spirit fails. Don't hide your face from me, or I will be like those going down to the pit. Let me experience your faithful love in the morning, for I trust in you. Reveal to me the way I should go, because I appeal to you. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord. I come to you for protection. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me to level ground. Let's go to the Lord ourselves in prayer this morning. Father, we hear in the words of David... One who is weak, one who is desperate, one whose life is spinning out of his control. Yet, Lord, he knows to whom to go. And, Lord, we too come to you this morning. I know some here may be desperate. Some may feel like their life is spinning out of control. Lord, I imagine all of us feel needy, and feel weak. And therefore, Lord, we come to you this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would listen to us quickly and answer our prayers and strengthen us. And I pray for this morning as we worship you, Lord, that you would be lifted up and glorified and that we, Lord, would be changed as we meet you today. And I pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Before we continue to worship, I want to share some announcements with you today. Yes, if you're a guest with us today, please uh, let me know or Pastor Brady know, and we will give you a gift. And please fill out the welcome card that's in the pew in front of you or use the QR code on the back of your bulletin and fill that out mobily. Uh, Today in our second service, uh, we have a special group. Uh, My son Johnny and his band from Carter Music School is going to be leading the music in the second service. And you say, well, why am I telling you this now in the first service? Well, just in case you wanted to hear them, you might want to sneak in for one song at the beginning and then uh, go home if you want to. But I just wanted to let you know that. I'm bragging on my son today. Is that allowed? Uh, Today is uh, the last day to update the church directory. If you haven't done so, please do that. And our teenagers will be finishing up the summer over the cross the street at Pastor Brady's house this Wednesday. Uh, women and men will have their breakfast meetings this Thursday at 9 a.m. at the Huddle House. 
and Bracey. So all men and women are welcome to do that. And we are looking for lunch buddies. Uh, Dale, do you have a number that we're down to? I hope it's getting less and less each week. Okay, that's going down, but it's still a long way to go. <laughs> yes. All right, so Dale is saying we still need 12 lunch buddies. And so we have a month to get those people in line. So please let Dale know if you'd be willing uh, to do that. And don't forget that the Mets information meeting is Thursday, August the 12th. Also, after the service in the Welcome Center, you can get a cookie and you can sign up and let them know that you are going to come that Thursday when there's ice cream and there's information about this new ministry. VBS is upon us in a couple of weeks. Register online, all of your children. And there is also YC Week at the same time, but on Thursday night, YC Week will be over at New Hope for Back to School Bash. And so I believe we do have a video that we are going to see that will show us about YC. This, oh, also, the last Sunday of the month will be different. I'm just going to leave it at that. We're having our business meeting on Sunday morning, and let's watch that video. I stood on a mountain before the Lord. A mighty windstorm struck, tearing loose at the rocks. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire.
I'm going to steal this microphone because I left mine in my office. So kids, I have a question for you, and it's kind of based out of one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Um, how often do you feel like you have to compare yourself to somebody else? Maybe you feel like you compare yourself to uh, your older brother, your older sister. Maybe you try to compare yourself to one of your friends. How many of you feel like you've tried to compare yourself to someone else before? And adults, you can answer that too. Do you ever feel like you compare yourself to somebody else? We'll say yes, because deep down, I think we all are kind of guilty of uh, trying to compare ourselves to someone else. And so one of my favorite stories in the Bible comes at the end of the Gospel of John. And uh, remember, in, in the Gospels, Peter has this moment where after Jesus is arrested, that he denies Jesus, and uh, he kind of starts wondering what's his place in this ministry. And so Jesus, at the end of the Gospel of John, takes him aside and says, you know, hey, you, you still have a part of this. I still love you. Uh, go out and tell other people about me. And so there's this moment at the very, very end where Peter and Jesus are talking, and Peter looks behind him, and he sees John. And so here's what it says. It says, so Peter turned around and saw the disciple Jesus loved following them, the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and asked, Lord, who is the one that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answers, if, you want, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. And so here's what Jesus is kind of saying in a very small nutshell little version of it. Uh, it doesn't necessarily matter what John's going to do, Peter. You are going to follow me. I have a mission for you to do. This is for you. And so what I think is important for us to remember, kids, is that God has something planned for you that he wants just you to accomplish. There's something in your life that he looks and says, you know what, this is exactly what I want Benji Bassett to do with his life, and he is going to do that. And if he doesn't, dad will be upset. <laughs> but so don't, like if you see what other people are doing, I mean, sure, you can look at them and be like, wow, they're really serving the Lord. But as for you, follow the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and pursue the things that he has for you. Jesus does not love some future version of you that doesn't exist yet. He loves you right now as you are and who you are. So we're going to embrace that, and we're going to follow him wherever he might take us, right? So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to continue worshiping together. So let's pray. Oops. Father, we are so glad that you have a plan, that it is good, that you, uh, that you love your children deeply. I just pray that we don't lose sight of you, that we're not distracted by what other people are doing, but we continue to pursue you in love and in faith. And in Jesus' name, amen. interesting this morning, Jan, as you said.
fire, not as planned, the weather, not as planned. And as I said, that all kind of fits in with what I wanted to share with you this morning as one of my favorite stories. And I'm kind of cheating this morning because I'm going to do four stories in one. Okay, is that allowed? <laughs> okay. So that's what we're doing today. We're in Mark chapter 4, if you want to turn there. Mark chapter 4. Speaking of out of control, hasn't it felt like for the last year and a half that things have been out of our control? As we've gone through the pandemic, hasn't it been others who have told us how to live our lives and others have told us what to do and really not because they had any really say in it, it's just that everything was different, everything was out of control. And uh, the virus seemed to be the one that was in control of everything, of making our lives the way that they should be. And as the virus seems to try to come back, I know that many are fearing that maybe we're going back to where we were last year. And in all of this uncertainty and all of this chaos and all of this unknown, it does feel like our lives are out of our control. And the stories we will look at this morning have four people who have done nothing to be in the circumstance they're in, yet they find themselves in it, and they are unable to do anything about it. And as you hear the familiar stories, I know you will find yourself in the place they were. As you think of your life in the past, as you think maybe of your life today. But why these are my favorite stories here in the Gospel of Mark is because of what we learn about how God has control over everything. So let's go to him in prayer and let's look at Mark chapter 4. Father, as we have said, our morning has already been not what we expected. But Lord, none of it took you by surprise. And Lord, often our life is not what we expect, but it hasn't taken you by surprise. And Lord, we at times in our life want to feel as though we control it and that we can make decisions and we can make our future. But Lord, I'm thankful for the times where you show us that you are the only one who is truly in control and that you have a reason for everything that happens in our lives. Lord, I pray our time in your word this morning would be encouraging, especially to those like David who prayed in Psalm 143 and those people we will see in the Gospel of Mark who need encouragement, they need miracles, they need uh, their life changed. And Lord, you did it. That's why I pray, Lord, our encouragement would come this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would lift us up, that you would encourage us, and you would point us to you, Lord. May you do so now as we open your word. And I pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen. I want you to imagine an evening around 30 A.D., almost 2,000 years ago, in the area of Judea. And that one evening, this is what was happening in four lives. There were the disciples with Jesus in the midst of a storm. But at the exact same time, there was a man cutting himself, demon-possessed in the tombs. There was a family who had a little girl. And she was getting sicker and sicker and sicker. They feared that she might die. And there was a woman who had spent her last pennies on doctors, hoping to be better, and nothing had changed. Isn't it true that you could, any evening, even here right in Mecklenburg County, 
You could make a list of people going through similar or worse things in their lives. I know we often don't imagine that. It's probably a good thing that we don't imagine all the misery of people that are around us. Uh, But here, I want you to see how all this was happening at the same time. As it does every evening in our world, every night. People's lives hit by tragedy. People's lives going down the wrong direction. People's lives out of their control. But yet, in all of them, Jesus is there. And he can do anything. Let's talk a little bit more about these situations. The disciples, you know this story very well. They are in a life-threatening situation. As I said, very appropriate for this morning. Uh, Jesus had been teaching all day long. His teaching had come to an end. And he said to his disciples, let's get in a boat and go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. When they started, I assume it was calm and sunny. Very shortly after they're out in the middle of that uh, lake, a storm comes up quickly, and a strong one, much like this morning. I assume it got dark, it got windy, the rain started coming, the waves started swamping the boat to the point that even the experienced fishermen in the boat feared for their lives. So that tells you how strong the storm was. It it wasn't just a a, a little storm. Sprinkle. Uh, Again, it wasn't a storm that these experienced fishermen had seen before, and they said, oh, we've got this, we can get through this. This was so severe that even they thought they were going to drown, they were going to die. And Jesus was there sleeping. And that's why the disciples said to Jesus, don't you care? They thought they were in a storm, and the Lord was sleeping, not doing a thing. But he must not care if they drown. Have you ever felt that way? That God doesn't care? We'll come back to them in a minute. On the other side of that lake was a man who was possessed by demons. Because of that, his life had been ruined. He he was supernaturally strong so that the townspeople tried to constrain him with chains and they couldn't, he'd break them off. He couldn't live in town, he had to live in the cemetery. He would scream. He would take rocks and he would cut himself. As you can imagine, a terrifying sight. As you can imagine, I'm certain everyone in town had given up on him. Everyone in town had a story about how they saw him or they heard him. Uh, You can imagine, maybe not how awful his life was, but you can imagine how awful the townspeople would have been to him. His life, it said when Jesus spoke to the demons that the demons said their name was Legion. A Roman legion of soldiers was 6,000. So if literally he was possessed by 6,000 demons, even if figuratively, the point is he was possessed by so many that his life was out of his control and there was nothing that he could do to help himself or to stop it. Have you ever felt that way? That there's nothing that you can do about what is happening to you. That's where he was. It wasn't like he could listen to some self-help advice. It wasn't like he could, you know, change his diet or uh, do some exercising or, you know, listen to a sermon. That wasn't going to change his life. There was nothing he could do. There was also a man who had a sick little girl. 
His name was Jairus. His daughter was getting sicker by the moment. He went to Jesus and and said to Jesus, Jesus, please come with me. My daughter is sick and she's dying. Maybe you have been there. A, A loved one is in the hospital. Maybe you've been at home and have seen your daughter, your spouse, your son, someone very close to you. You've given them the medicine. You've done everything that you can do. The doctors have done everything they can do. But nothing is changing. Nothing is happening. And you know how helpless it feels to... See someone you love dearly suffering and you can do nothing to stop it. I think probably every single one of us has experienced that. It's out of our control. And finally, there was this woman who was in the crowd when Jesus went with Jairus to his house. And she had been suffering for 12 years. Obviously, we're not told her medical condition in medical terms, but it involved bleeding that she could not control. What made her situation worse than the medical condition, she was, according to the law, ceremonially unclean, which meant that she could not go to the temple and worship. Other people could not touch her because they would become unclean. So can you imagine not only the the physical suffering, but really the, the mental as well. For 12 years, she had been barred from the temple. And I imagine people did not want to be too close to her, lest they become unclean and not be allowed in the temple. Then have to have a sacrifice and go through all of this. And they didn't want the hassle. Much easier just to stay away from her. She had taken all the money she had and given it to doctors in hopes that they would find a cure. But nothing. She had done everything that she could and nothing had changed. I'm sure you've been there too. Isn't that such a helpless feeling? You've spent the money. You've done what the doctors have said. You've done what people have said. You've done everything that you're supposed to do, that you can do. And you're not any better. In fact, Marx tells us she kept getting worse. How defeating. So let's pause for a moment. We we find the disciples questioning whether God cares for them. We have a man possessed by demons who can't do anything about his situation. We have a father and a mother looking at their daughter suffering. And they can't do anything. And a woman who has done everything she can. And nothing has changed. I imagine that you can identify maybe with all four of them. Not in the exact situation. But in those feelings of helplessness. And feelings of a life out of control. If you know the stories, you know the reason why they're in the Gospel of Mark. Not because of the human suffering but because of what Jesus does. And so these four people, I guess we call the disciples, it's more than four of them, but you know, these four situations, all have three things that we Christians always have too when we feel like our life is out of control. First, they had Jesus. And each one of the stories 
The disciples were with Jesus. Jesus goes to the man who's demon-possessed. Jairus goes to Jesus. The woman goes to Jesus. They knew who to go to. I mean, the demon-possessed man had no control. He's just in the cemetery. But the others are with Jesus. They went to him because they knew Jesus could do something. They couldn't, but Jesus could. And that's true for us. We may have a life out of control, and we may not be able to do something, but we can go to Jesus. Obviously, we don't physically go to him like Jairus did, but we go to him in prayer. Jesus is with us. He does hear us. We can go to him. We all have Jesus as they did. Also, we have the words of Jesus. And these are very important in these situations. Again, we don't have Jesus speak to us physically face to face as these people did. But we have Jesus speak to us in the word of God. Jesus speaks to us as we talk to him and pray. And so Jesus may have words of encouragement... He may have words of rebuke. He may have words of wisdom, of teaching. But those words are significant. And began these people on the way to a changed life. To the disciples, they had a promise from Jesus before they got in the boat. He said, let's go over to the other side. They should have kept that in mind when the storm came. Afterwards, Jesus had words of rebuke to them. This really was a test for them. They had heard Jesus speak all day. And up to this point, they'd seen him do miracles. So they were like a lot of Christians, I think. They heard sermon all Sunday morning, and then Sunday afternoon they failed the test. Okay? Because they didn't learn anything at all from what they heard all Sunday morning. And so the disciples heard it all and then got in a boat, should have remembered Jesus said, we're going over to the other side, should have remembered everything he's done, should have remembered, should have had faith, but they didn't. But they need to hear those words of rebuke. Yeah, maybe they weren't comforting words, but they were needed words. To Jairus. Jesus said these words, don't be afraid, only believe. Because you see what happened, his daughter was alive when he went to Jesus. But when he, the woman you know, was there, kind of interrupted everything, the word came to Jairus, her daughter's dead. I can imagine hearing those words, how it would have cut him and hit him. He had been helpless, but he had hope. That's why he'd gone to Jesus. There was that sliver of hope, I'll get to Jesus. And he got to Jesus, and he questioned Jesus, and Jesus was following him. So he, he, he had hope. He had hope that his daughter would live. But now the words come, she's dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? But Jesus said to him, Don't be afraid. Only believe. Those are words not only of encouragement, but words to continue to have faith. He had had faith before that Jesus could heal. Well, have faith now that Jesus can do even more. And then when they did get to the house... Jesus said to the crowd, the child is not dead, she is asleep. The people in the crowd laughed at Jesus. They knew she was dead. But those were words to Jairus and to his wife. Because what happens when a little girl's asleep? She wakes up. There was a hint, an implication to him. Don't be afraid. Keep believing. 
Your daughter's just asleep. You're about to see something amazing. Uh, To the woman, he said, daughter, your faith has saved you. Because what she did was she went into the crowd and she touched Jesus. And when she touched him, immediately she was healed. She could sense it in her body. She was completely healed. She tried to get away, walk back off in the crowd, but Jesus wanted to see her. So he asked the disciples, who touched me? And they say, Jesus, come on. I mean, there's all kinds of people around you. We don't know who touched you. A lot of people have touched you. But Jesus wanted to make sure that this woman heard these words from him. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be healed. Words of encouragement to her. They had these words of encouragement, of rebuke, of continuing to have faith. We have the words of Jesus that do the same for us. So I encourage you, when your life feels helpless, go to Jesus and listen. There may be an encouragement to continue and to persevere and to have faith because this story is not finished. Uh, There may be words of rebuke. Maybe they're words of stop moping and pouting. uh, Stop being faithless. But there will be words that help. Words that heal, words that change. And the power of the Lord is displayed and gives us hope for our lives. You know, just with his words, Jesus said to the storm, silence, be still. And that was it. A storm that had quickly come up, even quicker, stopped. Because Jesus has control over nature. He has control over what's uncontrollable by humans. We complain about the weather, but we can't change it. We can complain about it, and we can forecast it, and we can tell you what's going on, but there's not one thing that a human can do to change the weather. But God has control over it with just his words. That's a powerful God. It's interesting to me why this storm even came up. I believe... It's possible, maybe even probable, this was demonic itself. The words that are used in the Gospel of Mark when, in a sense, the storm is cast out. Remember, there's a a man on the other side who's being possessed by demons. Satan wants the situation to stay the same. If he can stop the boat from getting across, if he can stop it, if he can drown the disciples, if maybe he thought he could drown Jesus... There's going to be no freedom for that man. Did that storm stop the Lord? No. He stopped it with his words. They went on across the sea. And to the demon-possessed man, he said, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. The townspeople couldn't do anything. The man himself couldn't do anything. But all Jesus had to do was say to them, Come out. And the man was healed. He was freed. His life was changed. The townspeople saw him clothed, because he was always running around naked and cutting himself. And and it says, in his right mind. We don't know, but maybe it had been years since they had ever seen him that way. And it was simply by the Words of the Lord. The Lord has power over the most powerful beings in this universe. Uh, The angels are more powerful than we are. Yet the Lord tells the angels what to do and where to go. Uh, The demons are fallen angels and Satan a fallen angel. But they don't wreak havoc on this world without the control of the Lord. 
The Lord gives them permission. The Lord, when he wants them to stop, <laughs> casts them out. He said, we don't have to be afraid even of the angels and the demons because the Lord has control over them too. Two, the woman, this is what it says in Mark. Having heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothing. For she said, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be made well. Instantly her flow of blood ceased and she sensed in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Jesus didn't even have to say anything to her. <laughs> he has power over sickness, illness, disease. And I know there is testimony after testimony after testimony in this church of God healing. God healing miraculously. The way I like to say it, God proving doctors wrong. Because doctors will say, there's nothing I can do. There's no hope. You only have three months to live. And God says, I will determine what's going to happen, not you. And people will be miraculously healed. And the doctors say, I don't know how it happened. People who are given three months to live will live 10, 15 years. And the doctors will say, I don't know how it happened. The Lord has power. And the Lord is the one who heals. How did it happen? The Lord, Jesus, is the one. And finally, Jairus' daughter was dead. But listen to the words of Jesus. By his words, he says to the little girl, Talith kum, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, get up. And she was alive. Maybe a storm. Well, controlling that, maybe that's not a big deal. Uh, to some people, I don't know. Controlling the demons, controlling uh, sickness, but raising people who are dead to life. God can do all of these things. It shows us God can do anything. And God can do the impossible. And do you see where the hope comes from here? Whether we feel hopeless, helpless, our life is out of control, every time, really every moment of our lives, we have these three things. We always have Jesus with us. We always have his words. And we always have a powerful Lord who not only is powerful, but he is good. And because he's good, he has a purpose and a good purpose for our lives. And so when you're in those situations, you go to the Lord. When you're in those situations, you listen to his words. When you go to the Lord, you have faith. Because, as I just said, we may not know why something's happening, and we may have no control over it, but we know who does, and we trust the Lord that He knows why this is happening, and that He has a purpose for it happening, and that's faith. And so we can face every situation with faith, and therefore not fear about it, not worry about it. But go to the Lord. And allow Him to change it. Now I know it's true that God does not raise every dead person to life. If that were true, every person who ever lived would still be living right now, right? There wouldn't be any cemeteries. God does not heal everyone who is sick. There are those who have a life that's ruined that remains that way for their entire lives and God doesn't change it. There are people who drown in storms and the Lord doesn't calm the storm. That's why we have to have faith. God can 
change anything and do anything. But he doesn't always choose to. And the question is why? And the answer is I don't know. But I know that the Lord knows. And that's faith. And with faith, we can confidently go into life even if God may not change our life or may not heal our loved one. But we know there's a reason why he hasn't. And it's for our own good. Tell others what God has done for you. The demon-possessed man, he said, Jesus, let me stay with you. (laughs) You know, Jesus had changed his life. He wanted to go with Jesus. Jesus said, no, 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 don't go with me. He said, but go back to your town and you tell everybody what the Lord's done for you. Now, he had a testimony, didn't he? But you do too. The Lord has changed your life. If he's done nothing else, he saved you. And I know there's times where he has healed. I know there's times where he's given you direction. I know there's times where your life has been changed because God was in your life. And you have a testimony. Go and tell it. The testimony of the disciples and Jairus and the demon-possessed man. and They're all here in the scripture. They're testimonies of the power of God to encourage us. And that's why it's one of my favorite stories that encourages me. Well, other people are encouraged when they hear your story. So don't keep what the Lord has done to you, to yourself. We must go and tell. Brothers and sisters, wherever you are today, know that Jesus is with you. He has words to encourage you. And he can do the impossible. Father, I pray now that you would help us to respond to your word. And Father, I pray for those right now who feel like those we have heard in the Gospel of Mark this morning. Because I know right now people may feel hopeless because their life can't change. They can't do. Their life's out of control. Lord, I pray for them especially that the words they have heard this morning would give them encouragement that, Lord, you would speak to them. And that, Lord, you would answer their prayer. Lord, I also pray for us to have faith. For, Lord, it is hard to understand why some receive a miracle from you and others don't. And why tragedy takes the lives sometimes of 12-year-old girls or 12-year-old boys. Yet men or women who defy your name live into old age. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen our faith this morning. For God, you're the all-wise, the all-knowing God. And you are a God who loves and has a purpose and a plan for our life. May those truths be deep in our soul and our heart and give us faith. I pray, Lord, that you would help us now to respond to your truth. And I pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Stand with me, please, and we will sing. But as we sing, we are responding to what God has spoken to us this morning. I'll be here to pray with you. Again, like I said, now we have a place to come and kneel before the Lord and pray. So if you want to pray, or I'll pray with you, or make a commitment to the Lord, sure. Do so now as we sing. Victory in Jesus. You can't help but smile and sing loudly when we sing this song. So let's do so.
Lord, we have victory in you, and we are thankful, Lord, for your victory over sin, over demons, over death, over sickness, over the creation. Lord, you have victory and power over everything. Lord, may we go into this week with faith and confidence and courage because of that. May you cast out all fear and worry and doubt. And Lord, may we go and tell all the wonderful things you have done for us. And we pray your blessing upon us and this week in your name, Jesus. Amen.